for a motion and a second on approving the agenda. Pleasant Hill moves. Move motion by Lab. Second. Second by Boss. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Item three is to approve the meeting minutes from the May 19 meetings. So moved. Both by boss. Second. 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 Josh beat you to it. So any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, item three is uh, the consent and vote on the financial statements, Todd. Thank you. Um, just our normal uh, monthly expenses, nothing out of the ordinary for this month. We did have a reimbursement for the, the final one for the Translook facility. Um, other than that, I'd recommend approval. I'm happy to answer any questions. Move. County. Motion by Hawkins, Smith. Second by Haddon. Second by Haddon. <laughs> any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Any abstention? Item five uh, is tracks and expenses, Todd. The next line, next line. Just one uh, for you um, on a legal fees recommend approval. Any questions? Todd, what's the legal fees for? Um, some of it's are, are normal, but then also for uh, water trails and uh, for MIPA as well. Move approval. Magado. Second, Reva. Mayor Reva, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Item five is public comment on MPO actions. Do it, Todd. Do we have anybody? To comment? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I am uh, seven then would be the report and vote on the fiscal year 2326 transportation improvement program. Aspen. Thank you. Um, as of yesterday, we submitted our draft tip to the DOT. Um, and so the project list that you received in your agenda packet has since been updated. Um, the new one will be sent out with your uh, meeting follow-up, but otherwise you can look on the MPO website and see the actual full document, so not just the projects, but it'll also have um, summaries about funding sources, performance measures. Um, we will have a public input meeting, which will be hybrid, so you can either come here to the MPO office or join us on Zoom next Thursday at 5 p.m. And then the final tip will be due to the DOT on the 15th. So we'll incorporate, right, excuse me, we'll incorporate any feedback we received from the DOT, Federal Highway, and FTA um, for that. Um, so please review your jurisdiction project for accuracy and completeness. Um, a couple jurisdictions need. Um, I will reach out specifically to, but if you review that actual full draft on the website, um, you'll see that a couple projects have their status missing. And so I will be specifically reaching out for projects that I still need a status update for. Um, again, we've received edits from Anthony, Watsi, West Des Moines, and Windsor Heights um, since our last meeting um, and review the full draft. And if you have any questions about funding sources or changes, um, this will be up to our, I've also updated um, with the conversion from swap dollars to now being federal aid, that's all updated in the tip as well. Um, and so some project numbers have changed, um, but unless they will be constructed um, or let before that February 2023 date, um, they can still remain swap dollars. So I'll take any questions if folks have them. Otherwise, I would recommend the draft for approval. All right. Thank you, Aspen. Any questions for Aspen on this side? for a motion in a second. Motion. Motion by Madam. Second. Second by Madam Toya. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed same sign? That motion carries. All right. Uh, item A is a report and vote on the fiscal year 22-25 transportation improvement program. 
Um, we have four amendments uh, for the DOT to reach um, a summer letting date. Um, and so um, the first one here is a Polk County I-80 interchange pavement parking project. And again, we're just moving it from 2023 into 2022, which is why we need an amendment. Um, this is the first one. The second one, um, also Polk County, it's an I-235 interchange pavement parking project. Again, just moving it from 2023 into 2022. The third one, um, is um, a scope change for Warren County Project I-35 interchange pavement markings. Not only are we moving up to 2022, but we're also starting now south of Iowa 92 instead of 94. And then the last um, amendment we have here, um, also in Warren County, um, when I brought this before executive, I had the wrong highway number here. So I think I said Iowa maybe 42 or something, but it's Iowa 28, um, and the federal aid amounts and total costs are, are different um, than what I presented to exec, those numbers have changed. Um, but the actual amendment is just moving the project forward into 2022. So there's no cost changes. I just have the incorrect cost when I presented to exec last week. So All the right. amendment here again is just moving it forward. Okay. And that'll take any questions, otherwise recommend for approval. All right. Thank you. Questions for asking on this. Move approval. Second. Motion is second. Who moved that? I did. Joe Gatto. Okay. 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 Second. Second by Hawkins Smith. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye, please. Aye. 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 same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carried. Thank you, Asker. Uh, item uh, nine is report and vote on the safe streets for all grant. Zach. Thank you. Uh, one of the new funding programs um, under the new bill is a program called the safe streets for all grant. Um, the NOFA for this was released um, a few weeks ago at the end of May um, and applications for this program are due, um, I believe, September 15th. There's approximately a billion dollars available in this over the next four uh, in each of the next four years. Um, and basically the, the main purpose of this funding is to look at improving the safety of roadways. Um, there's two different uh, th things under this. There's the action plan portion of it and there's implementation. So on the action plan side of things, you can request an award of a minimum of $200,000 up to 1 million if you're a city, um, if you're an MPO or it's a multi-jurisdictional application, you can ask for as much as $5 million. Um, the implementation grants, um, $5 million for a minimum award on implementation, $30 million if you're an individual jurisdiction, and then up to $50 million if you're an MPO or a multi-jurisdictional application. Um, next slide, please. So we've been spending some time reviewing, reviewing the NOFA and, and this uh, funding program, and at this point, what staff is recommending is that the MPO pursue a regional application for this. This would get us into that multi-jurisdictional category. Um, we sat in on some webinars and it's our understanding that you know, applicants that are multi-jurisdictional or MPOs have a better chance of getting funding through this program. Um, any, any city within the MPO that would want to apply for this funding would have to show that they have an action plan that meets all their requirements. And to our knowledge, there isn't anybody that currently has an action plan that meets all of its requirements. The city of Des Moines is currently working on a plan that will probably meet those requirements. I know their, their intent is to have their plan meet those requirements, but if any other community in the region wanted to apply for this funding, they wouldn't be able to unless they produced a plan. Um, so from the staff perspective, we felt like it'd be more efficient if we produced a regional plan that would qualify everybody for the implementation dollars. We've had a number of our member governments approach us and ask us about this and request that we consider um, pursuing this um, application for an action plan. Um, next slide. So there are things that we are still considering. Um, you know, one thing is whether or not we would do a joint application between the MPO and SERPA. This would, I think, probably make this more competitive because we have more jurisdictions then involved in the application. Um, and it would also just allow the communities outside of the MPO area as well to have access to this uh, funding. Um, another thing that we're considering is just how much to request. Um, some of this might depend on whether or not we go in with SERPA on this or if we just stick to the MPO. 
but that amount has to be decided on just how much we think it's going to cost to do the plan, how much we want to ask for. And what also plays into that is where the local match is coming from and how we, how we collect that local match. So it might be that the MPO um, and SERPA can put together enough local match through our reserve funds that we could cover the cost on this. Um, we might consider going out and doing a small assessment to the communities who want to be a part of it. Um, I think these are all things that we need to discuss further to decide how we want to approach that. Uh, but right now, really what we're seeking is feedback from the policy committee on whether or not you'd be supportive of the MPO pursuing this application before we do too much work or go into too much detail on uh, the background of this. We just want to make sure that we had your approval to move forward with it. Um, we would be coming back to you with more details as far as how much we anticipate the, the plan would cost and what that local match would be and how we would propose to come up with that local match before we would submit that application. Uh, so you would have obviously another chance to, to approve the actual details of the grant uh, before we submitted it in September, but just wanted to make sure that we have support to move forward with this. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Hey, Zach, this is Tom Hawkinsmith of Polk County, and I, I want to understand this better. And maybe I know the devil's always in the details, but um, I'm curious. So if, if an application is submitted for one of these safe streets or roads grant programs, then um, is it a, I assume it's a jurisdictional uh, organizational application opposed to a project by project application. The reason I ask we're talking about this. The first thing that strikes me, you know, um, is the Northeast 23rd uh, reconstruction project. And, you know, there's no sidewalks, two lane county road, uh, you know, uh, multiple developments going on where there's residential um, traffic um, volume additional as well as pedestrian traffic. I mean, would that be would that be even eligible for something like this or how would that work? Um, I think. It, I mean, depending on what kind of safety elements you put into that application, it certainly would be eligible to submit if we have an action plan that covers that area. And I guess that's kind of what, you know, why we're proposing that we submit an application first for the action plan so that we can have a regional action plan. And then everybody within the region I in see. the future funding rounds would be able to apply for the implementation side of the funding. Okay. If that's we don't helpful. do the action plan, then, then nobody's eligible for it. Nobody, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's helpful. Thanks. Um, Zach, uh, Ruth Randleman here. We've talked about this as an exec, but um, I have an additional question. I get the, um, it's a large dollar amount for the implementation. Does that have to be a one-time shot where several jurisdictions, for instance, if it's a small community, it would be a one-time project that would have to be quite inclusive for us to make the minimum of the uh, implementation money? Or can you go up to an amount and submit applications more one by one, if you understand what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, my, and Dylan jump in if I get something wrong here, but my understanding is that once, let's say the MPO applies for the action plan money, we get the money, we finish the action plan, my understanding is that any community within the MPO area could then apply for implementation dollars individually. Um, so I think it could be for whatever, you know, if they have a, a project that's one roadway and fairly large, or if they have a project that involves doing multiple things across their whole community, I think it really is pretty flexible there. Um, does that answer your question? Well, well, I guess the question is, from one jurisdiction, does it have to meet that five million minimum? No, and, and my understanding from the webinars is that they put those minimums in there as like what they anticipated the minimum request would be, but they seem to indicate that there wasn't an actual minimum amount that a community could ask for. Okay. If you had a smaller project that was under five million, my understanding, and we can certainly double check on this, but my understanding is that you would still be able to submit that, say if it was a $3 million project. And is the local, what's the local match? It's an 80-20, so 20%. Okay. That would be the bug because we could find easy $5 million of work, but we'd have to make the match. 
Right. So it, it would limit the smaller communities. But I, I, I think it's great. I think it's a great opportunity. I've, um, and once, like Tom said, the devil's in the details. I would right. really like the opportunity because you could partner with somebody else maybe um, on something that's uh, connected. So, I mean, that's, it's a great opportunity, I think. Yeah, just to add on to that too, what Zach was saying, it, it, when you get to the implementation side of thing, it wouldn't have to be each community going on their own. There could be a regional or a couple of communities getting together that might be along the same corridor applied to, for that implementation dollars too. So that might be another option for you, Ruth, if you, if Carlisle gets to that point and wants to partner with Des Moines on a project or, or something like that, that'd be an option too. Yeah, well, it's a great, it's a great chance at something anyway. Uh, um, so with the Des Moines Vision Zero uh, plan qualify as an action plan? In our conversations with John Davis and some of the city staff, it, it sounds like they've instructed the consultants to make sure it does comply, but it wouldn't be, my understanding is that plan won't be completed in time to meet this round of funding. The first year, but it's the first year, but in but subsequent years. Five so that uh, could we then qualify for upcoming years? Yes. First year, no, but the upcoming years, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, as long as it meets everything, which it sounds like it will. And we've also talked that even though Des Moines is doing its thing, um, having its own plan, it's still, at least the staff's intention, Des Moines staff's intention is that they'd still cooperate and be involved with the regional plan if we get to that point too, so that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have two plans that don't work together. Des Moines can still have its own, but it would feed into the larger. All right, right. So we've selected a vendor and vendors on site June 27th, I think, to start the work. So 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 hopefully we would qualify again. Did you say it's a five-year plan? So two, three, four, and five, we could qualify for right. the best thing you understand. Yes. And then, I would move it. Poke this poke out, I'll move it. Okay, Tom, we have a little more discussion here. Okay. It's not. What I was just going to say, and Zach can affirm this too, is that Federal Highway doesn't review our plans either. The city, you know, whoever comes up with the plan, it's more of a self certification too. So there's a little flexibility probably on what that plan looks like and whether projects qualify for it. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Motion by Hawkins, is there a second? Second. Second, second. second by Boss. Second. second by Boss. <laughs> any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All the same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Item 10 is report and vote on the fiscal year 23 investment policy, Todd. Thank you. Next slide, please. So each year, the, the MPO has to uh, approve its investment policy uh, for the next fiscal year. The MPO currently holds a checking and money market account at First National Bank. We also have an investment account at IPay a Trust administered by Wells Fargo. Um, as mentioned, we review this policy annually. Um, policy is updated last year to add savings and money market accounts to the list of approved investment in instruments. It hadn't had that in it. Uh, so we wanted to make just to cover ourselves. We wanted to make sure it was documented in, in the policy document itself. Um, Finance subcommittee did, didn't recommend any changes for this year. Uh, so I don't think there's another slide, but um, no. So unless there's any questions, uh, I would recommend approval. Move. Second. Motion by Hawkinsmith, second by Murray. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Item 10 is report and vote on the self-certification. Thank you. As we get to the end of the fiscal year, we like to go through and self-certify our our operations. Uh, this is a requirement by USDOT and we typically put it into the tip. So in the tip, one of the appendices is the self-certification. Uh, but during our last federal review, they asked that we pull that out and do a little bit more deliberate presentation to the board and make sure everybody's aware that that's even in the tip. Um, so the self-certification just goes through and of these eight items that are you can see on the screen and that are in the agenda packet. Um, just affirms that we do comply with these. And some of these we comply because we don't violate them and other things we comply because we do something proactive to make sure that we comply with it. So for example, we have a Title VI documentation. That's something we tangibly put together. The board proves it. We have it on file for, 
for anybody that wants to you know, file a Title VI complaint or understand what we do with that. But we also don't violate the Clean Air Act. There's nothing we have to do to demonstrate that other than just not violate it. So um, in the agenda packet on page 17, there's an actual sort of certificate that will go into the tip. Um, but we just want to make sure that you're aware that that's there. And if there's any questions of, of what we do here, happy to take them. Otherwise, we ask for your approval. Move approval. Motion by Gatto. Second. Second okay. by Murray. Any further discussion? All favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Item 12 was a report and vote on the Des Moines Industrial Reimbursement to the MPO. Zach? Yes, thank you. Um, real quick before I get into the uh, reimbursement from DM, Des Moines Industrial, I just want to give you a quick update on the Transla facility. We did find out that on Friday, Des Moines Industrial finalized an agreement with Ziegler Caterpillar. Uh, it's a six-year lease for 100% of the warehouse space, plus an additional three acres of the laydown area around the warehouse. So they're uh, very excited about uh, locking in Caterpillar for the warehouse. Um, they're also anticipating that within the next uh, 45 days or so, they're going to have an additional four to six companies that have uh, agreed to be tenants in their laydown yard. So just wanted to give you that update uh, real quick. Uh, next slide. Uh, so if you'll recall, uh, back in October of 2019, we signed an agreement with Des Moines Industrial uh, for Transload Development Operations. Um, part of this agreement was that Des Moines Industrial would pay back or reimburse the MPO for up to $250,000 in costs that were incurred uh, by staff and uh, legal fees and such as part of the project, just as far as us being a fiscal agent of the project. Um, staff has gone back through and determined that over the life of the project, uh, we spent just a little bit over $250,000 um, in costs. Next slide. So the agreement um, outlines a couple of different things. Um, the payments will be made in quarterly installments over the next eight years, so a total of 32 payments. Um, the commencement date in the agreement was set to be 25 months after the first advancement of funds under the RRLG agreement. And that at first date of advancement funds was February 12th, 2020. So if we were you know, following the agreement, we would have, uh, the commencement date would have been March of this year. Um, considering that in March, the facility was not operational yet, and it's still just, you know, getting up and running, um, staff is proposing that we would hold off on invoicing for those payments and not start those until January 1st of 2023. But we wanted to make sure that the policy committee was okay with us doing that uh, before we moved forward. And um, that's what we're here today to um, have you approve just us uh, pushing off until January 1st of 2023 to have those payments start. Payments start. Um, to give you an idea, each payment's gonna be about $7,800 or so. I'd be happy to take any questions. Zach, any, any questions for Zach on this item? Move approval, Zach. I got him. Second. Second by boss. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Uh, I am 12, or excuse me, I have 13 as a report on the executive director annual review and compensation adjustment. And just to note, we don't have anything for this month for the policy committee, but I have appointed uh, Ted Weaver from Clive to chair this, along with uh, the, uh, another member of the committee, or Jeff Walters from Polk City, and Ruth Randall from Carlisle. And so they will be doing the review. They anticipate bringing back a report to the executive committee at the July meeting. Uh, we don't have a July uh, policy committee meeting, so we'll bring that back to the policy committee in August. So that's that's where we are right now. Uh, any questions, we'd be happy to answer at this point. Okay. Moving on then, item 14 is a report on the federal aid swap fund to the federal aid conversion. Andrew. Thank you. So uh, Iowa DOT recently announced that due to the increase in new federal funds they are receiving through the passage of the Transportation Bill um, and Sugar Act, uh, that has impacted their ability to continue to provide swap funds for local public agencies um, and projects. So just as a quick background, over the last few years, Iowa has let federal aid swap projects totaling over $150 million annually. 
um, due to the increase in federal funding um, and maintenance of uh, state dollars. Future projects for highway mm -hmm. swap availability are only $50 million annually. So meaning that that difference will need to be converted back to federal aid. So uh, as of right now, the proposal to um, the, the, the DOT is proposing is that uh, all of city and county highway bridge program funding, um, all STBG programming for all county projects and all STBGs uh, funding provided through TMAs and POs and the ICAP program all be converted back from swap to federal aid. So that means that uh, in our MPO area, cities must convert projects uh, starting with the February 21st, 2023 bid letting date. So the Local Systems Bureau has been working with us and we've been working with local communities to rescind um, local, the existing swap funding agreements and replace them with federal aid funding. So we've been working with staffs on this the last few months at the past. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone may. Thank you, Andrew. How many projects? So the impact to the MPO is somewhat minimal because the MPO doesn't uh, fund projects typically above 50% with MPO dollars. Um, so in other MPO areas uh, that they could have funded all of the project with STBG swap dollars, but that doesn't happen here. But that does mean that Net, the federal procurement guidelines will apply for certain things as well as uh, Davis Bacon and other federal provisions for future projects. Answer your question, Carl. Good. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not Carl. Sorry. All right. But that answers your question. Okay. We're good. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, item uh, 15 is to consider the Purple Heart Highway update. Gunner, report on that, please. Coming back to you again with an update. Um, the Iowa DOT, as you know, has been doing a stakeholder engagement process, and I believe we shared with you last month an action plan that was put together, a two page summary document with a few uh, high level stops along the way of what's going to need to happen between now and designation. Um, since then, we've had the opportunity to catch back up with the Iowa DOT and learn that in addition to the two pages that they put together, they will be producing a full length report that will include um, their notes and high level takeaways from all their stakeholder engagements. That's going to be particularly important for the ag community. Uh, we know the ensuring that the ag community can continue to use the corridor is going to be key to uh, having it designated as an interstate. Um, DOT is still wrapping up its meetings with stakeholders. I know the, one of the big ones that are outstanding is um, that they're wanting to meet with a couple of Iowa DOTs that have recently gone through the process of having the roadways designated as interstates so they can take away some of those lessons learned. Um, a couple other notes here um, is that we did get clarification and clarity from the Iowa DOT that their expectation is that once their stakeholder process is done and they have the report produced to us, it's really going to be handed out to the MPO and local jurisdictions for implementation or, or driving that process uh, toward the interstate designation. Uh, we've been asking for the Iowa DOT for a very specific set of steps, of, you know, what things need to happen before the DOT will make that interstate designation request for the region. Um, the other thing I'll note is on the DMDC trip last month, uh, our congressional delegation seemed very supportive of this effort. And to quote uh, Sherry Foods and Grassley's office, she said, this time feels different. Uh, so at some point here in the, in the near future, we'll get a working group together to start working on implementation steps. Um, so that's where things stand today. We're, we're in a little bit of a waiting pattern yet with the Iowa DOT, but they're coming to a close and we're starting to have an understanding of what that handoff is going to look like and who's going to be a right point. So um, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them. All right. Any questions for Gunnar? Thank you. I know Andy's on here too. Andy, anything further to add from your perspective for the DOT? I don't think I have anything to add. Just that, you know, kind of like you guys waiting to see. Uh, you know, what some of the final report might be and what some of those uh, stakeholder meetings, you know, had as, uh, you know, discussion items and things like that. So be right. happy to work forward on this. 
right. I appreciate we appreciate that. We know we've had a lot of discussion of exactly on that too. And just want to make sure there was anything new since we last talked. So thanks, Andy. And thank you, guys. And we'll move on then to the water trails update. Todd. Uh, thank you. Next slide. Um, as as we talked last month, we were submitting the um, revised scope uh, for the build grant agreement for the twenty five million dollars. Uh, we did get that approved on June third from the Office of Secretary of Transportation, uh, and kept the full twenty five million dollars with that revised grant agreement. So we were very happy about that. Uh, there was a condition put in there. Um, that construction of Birdland and, and Prospect would commence um, by September 30, 2027. Uh, the amendment, uh, amended agreement has been signed um, by uh, the MPO, the DOT and Federal Highway. I got that back uh, yesterday uh, from Federal Highway. So we have the new agreement in place. We had a meeting last week um, with the consultant team um, and, and some of our, our partners on uh, where we're at with the uh, uh, the revised scope and, and cost estimates, and we've uh, trimmed some things down as far as using different materials or different construction techniques to to get the the where we think uh, we need to be as far as the bid estimate, and we'll be uh, tightening those documents up uh, in the next couple months and get the the bid let uh, again uh, September uh, timeframe September October. And we're also working on the, the various uh, agreements with um, ICON, uh, the City of Des Moines, Polk County, uh, Federal Highway, some of those, and DOT, some of those sub agreements uh, that, that are underneath the, the main build grant agreement. So those will be uh, taking place in the next uh, few weeks as well. Be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Todd. Any questions for Todd on this side? Uh, I have the seven teams report on the economic development district. Okay. I'll take this one today. We met the city planner, Caleb Houston's at a conference. Um, so I'll keep this fairly tight, uh, but we've been very happy with Caleb. He's getting in there. Uh, he's really just kind of digging into the work. Uh, we had our first board meeting late last month, passed the budget, did some of the basic stuff, but other than that, no major actions were taken. Um, we do have some ongoing discussions with some non-member communities, um, and uh, Caleb has gotten to work um, visiting with some of the communities. So I would encourage everyone in the room who's a member uh, to reach out and start having those conversations. Uh, goal of understanding your projects and uh, understanding what funding is available so we can help connect those opportunities with your organizations. Also, getting to work on some grant applications. I do want to do a real brief update on membership. This number keeps ticking up a little bit at a time. We're now 54 jurisdictions out of the 96 eligible, um, but most of the ones that are not joined us yet are, are generally pretty small. If you look at the population covered by those jurisdictions, we are north of 91, nearly to 90% of the population. Um, I'm not going to go through this in too much depth, but this is a little bit of a scorecard, so to speak, of grants of board received so far. In total awards uh, that we've been able to capture so far, about $4.4 million. So this reporting will get more sophisticated as the organization matures, uh, and we're hoping to have a good baseball batting average. You know, we don't want to, we're going to go after, um, you know, we'll be a little bit aggressive in going after grants, knowing that we're not going to get them all, uh, but hopefully we'll be smart for those applications and bring home a, a fair percentage of them. So I'd be happy to take any questions you might have at this time. Hey, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, I got a quick. I just got a quick comment. Um, and Gunnar, maybe you can respond to this. I, you know, I I, I shared with you at the executive committee meeting, and I and I missed the last meeting based on a confusion about who was going to serve from Polk County standpoint. And I, I supported the idea that Polk County was going to be a partner in this. And I, I've read through a lot of the materials and what have you, and I just want to make sure that as you move ahead in this process. As an example, uh, a lot of the documentation that was shown identified specific initiatives as part of this um, effort that um, clearly overlap into other organizations' efforts. As an example, uh, disaster relief and things like that. That would, would you know, would, we have Polk County Emergency Management that does those things, and then 
you know, as I said before, you know, Polk County puts a quarter million dollars into the Gary and Moore Partnership every year for economic development efforts for us. So, and it seems like that there's an overlap, um, especially into uh, emergency response efforts that in basically what Polk County Emergency Management does and what all the jurisdictions participate in. So as long as you guys are communicating and you all understand who's uh, who's doing what, uh, that, so the, the feds don't get confused about, okay, we're getting an app for this, when actually we've, you know, if you're communicating, then we're good. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. I will speak to a couple of those points. And clarity of role has been a conversation that's been ongoing throughout this process. You've mentioned the partnership and emergency management. Uh, with regards to the Greater Des Moines Partnership, we had those conversations very early on with them, uh, and they were in agreement that the slice of economic development that an economic development district would do is not the kind of work that they wanted to do. They, they're interested in, in, you know, for example, recruiting businesses, um, but that's not what this organization uh, is set up to do. It's more, you know, its primary function is seeking, going after grants, administering those grants. And those are things that the partnership told us plainly that they were not interested in doing themselves and they supported a creation of an economic development district. Um, on the emergency management piece, we've had those conversations with AJ, uh, Councilmember Murray, uh, and others. And the, the bottom line is we're not looking to do emergency response. We're happy to help support emergency response through grant writing, et cetera, if and so the jurisdictions choose to use us as a resource for that. Uh, the other thing is just to be clear on communications, as you noted, uh, just to make sure that there's no confusion in the jurisdictions. We tried to be clear on that and we'll continue to try to be clear on that. Um, so thank you for raising the point. If you had any additional questions, I'd be happy to try to field those as well. No, no, that, that, that's fine. I, I just wanted clarification. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. All right. Uh, nothing further on that. We'll move to item eight and that's the legislative update. Doug? Thank you. I've got two uh, items here for you. The first one, let's go to the next slide. Is Last time we spoke, I mentioned that the appropriations bill, the way this process works is each representative could submit up to 15 projects for consideration in the next appropriations bill. And I think a few minutes after that meeting, we found out that the projects were submitted on, uh, the, what the 15 projects were, I should say. So there were two transportation projects from the MPO that made uh, Representative Axby's list. And that was $7 million for the airport and $7 million for Broadway Avenue reconstruction. That means that those have made it on into the process, but that does not guarantee that they will make the funding. That still has to be sorted out at the Appropriations Committee. Uh, the other update I have for you it has to do with implementation of the infrastructure bill. So last week, the Iowa DOT released a recommendation from a group of stakeholders um, that have been meeting for the last couple of months to figure out what to do with the various funding that flows through the DOT and out to the communities. Uh, they had a workshop last week, or earlier this week, they also presented uh, Sorry, they had a workshop with the DOT Commission earlier this week, and they also held a webinar yesterday for any stakeholders to participate in to explain this a little bit further. Uh, in our analysis of this, at least as it applies to the SDBG and TAP funding, uh, the MPO's TAP funding should go up fairly significantly by about $2 million uh, from about, where we're at about 13 million, we'll go up to about 15 million. TAP funding will go up a little bit as well, though not just because it's a much smaller pot, it won't go up as dramatically. Those dollars are also based on uh, 2010 census population because the population is a is a factor in the formula. So once we everything's upgraded to the 2020 census, our numbers will probably go up a little bit more from that. Um, people in the room at least probably can't read the details of this, but this is the flow chart to show how money goes from the federal government, the top down to the MPOs and RPA. So it's somewhat complicated. Um, the DOT though is providing uh, money that doesn't have to be spent sorry, money that can be spent anywhere in the state, they're turning around and putting it back into the formula that goes out through the MPOs, RPAs, and so forth. So that is a, a benefit that they're providing to us to keep us at a level that was established years and years ago, several transportation bills ago. So I do want to thank the DOT for doing that. Um, as we learn more, and as this process goes through, I think the DOT Commission is going to vote on this next month at the July meeting. Uh, so once that happens, that'll be finalized and some of these, dollars, you know, some of these mechanisms will be put into place where we'll start seeing um, the increased SDBG, the TAP, and there's a few other programs that, that tie into this as well. Um, new programs that we'll receive some funding for as well. Um, we'll start flowing down. So if there's any questions about that, I'm happy to address them. But this is a quick update for you. 
Gunner or Dylan? Uh, any questions for Dylan on this? And now Gunner will talk to the events. Thank you. Just a few events to make you aware. You've heard this one before. Masto Green Transportation Mobility for All. We are approaching that upcoming in July. We'll, we'll be sending these links to you in a follow-up email. Um, next up, draw your attention to a tour that's coming up of a couple of jurisdictions within the region. Uh, City of Perry, they have multiple uh, municipal operations with solar operations. And Johnson City Hall has a solar installation uh, as well. So that's coming up here next week. Starts at Johnson City Hall. Uh, and then after the tour there, there will be a bus to and from Perry with refreshments and late lunch. Um, Email address on the screen. You've got RSVP to that. And again, we'll get this de these details out to the email. That's it for uh, events. All right. Thank you, Gunner. Any other items of interest for the committee at this point? So, Gunner, if you don't mind, I can take it. So, I've got another one after this that's kind of related. So, um, is the infrastructure bill a couple other things coming out of this? Uh, there's a requirement, there's additional funding, there's a requirement uh, related to electric vehicle infrastructure that states are required to do a EV plan and consult in, in consultation with MPOs. So IODOT has developed a survey to get start getting feedback and that survey is up there on the screen. We'll provide that link to you as well in the, uh, in the follow up. Also, there's been a notice of funding opportunity for another program, which is the bridge investment program. This is another new program that provides discretionary dollars for bridges. There's, a little over $2 billion available nationally. There is a planning side of this, so $20 million of that is available for planning grants. Um, and then there's a remainder of that's for construction. And there's two aspects to the construction. There's construction for bridges over 100 million, and there's everything else. States, MPOs, cities, counties are all eligible to apply. There's different due dates depending on which program you're applying to, which are up there on the screen. So the earliest one is July 25th, latest one is September 8th. Um, again, we'll provide more information about this, and I'm sure all the communities have received this also from the IODOT and other venues, but we'll make sure to pass this along as well so that any communities interested in applying can do so. Okay. Thanks, Dylan. Any questions on that? Is that only highway bridges? I, uh, would a trail bridge apply? I don't know that answer. I can look at that. All right, anything further? All right, our next meeting day of the policy committee is August 18 at four o'clock. And with that, we are at the end of the agenda. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.